Uh, well, good morning. Uh, let me welcome you to this class. My name is uh, uh, Vinay Lal, and uh, this is a course uh, called The History of British India. So uh, let me uh, begin by uh, describing very briefly uh, the contours of this course, the parameters. Um, I will go over the syllabus in great detail uh, so that you have a very good idea of what is involved in taking this class. Uh, and I'm also going to spend a good deal of time uh, with some general considerations, uh, such as what does it mean to do history? Uh, what is it that might distinguish this course, let's say, from a number of other history courses? Um, and in particular, uh, I want you to be attentive uh, to the fact that when one does something like the history of British India, uh, one shouldn't be doing it only as a kind of curiosity or as some kind of archaeological artifact. I mean, after all, the British were in India for 200 years. They left in 1947 or were kicked out in 1947, depending on the particular mode of interpretation that you deploy. So this course is going to be a lot about interpretation, and it's also going to be about the present and when I say the present, I don't mean simply the fact that there are a great many things in India today which really go back to the period when the British were governing India, such as institutions in India, political institutions. India, India has a parliament. Uh, the fact that I'm speaking here before you in English, in fluent English, in rapid idiomatic English, uh, that has something to do with the fact that the British were in India. Now, that doesn't mean I'm grateful to them. I don't think you should even remotely infer that, right? But what I'm trying to suggest to you is that there are implications which continue down to the present day. And when we are studying the history of the British in India, we are studying colonialism. And frankly, from my standpoint, if you're studying colonialism, this is where you ought to be in the U.S. Because this is the seed, this is the seed of empire. This is empire that we're speaking about. So there are a great many things that you're going to find out about the history of the British in India, which might help you understand the United States too. Although I suspect that you didn't think that. It will also help you understand that the scholar administrators who governed India, and you're going to read some of their writings, were people whose level of intelligence was 50 orders higher than the man who was about to become the president of the United States. I mean, these people actually knew how to speak and write English. All right? So there are a great many things which I think you ought to be thinking about. You ought not to be thinking simply about the fact that we're speaking of a period of history from roughly 1600 to 1947 when the British were in India. They didn't govern India for that long, but the British presence in India goes back to the early 1600s. And we're going to end our course in 1947 when India acquired independence and the country was partitioned. Uh, that particular history is enormously interesting. We'll probably be able to spend about five, ten minutes on it when we get to the very end. If you're interested in the partition, I might just add a little footnote, namely that uh, the partition is something which was one of the most traumatic incidents in world history in the 20th century. Uh, 15 million people migrated. If you're thinking about the current Syrian refugee crisis, you're thinking about refugees coming in from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Libya, moving into Europe, and all the tensions that has created. Well, there were 15 million people who crossed borders when India became free. And there were about a million people who were killed. Uh, and we're going to be able to spend, as I said, just a few minutes on that because that's the very end of the course. But I am teaching a seminar on the partition of India, which actually meets today, if anyone's still interested in doing a history seminar, uh, meeting this afternoon at 1 o'clock. So let me first begin by uh, describing to you very briefly the requirements for this class. This class also, by the way, is being video streamed. Uh, which means that you have all of these lectures available to you, you know, uh, until the end of the quarter. Okay, until the end of the quarter, until after, ex until the end of exam week. 
And so you can go back to the lectures. And as you'll see, you have two exams, but they're take-home exams, as I'm going to discuss the requirements in detail. So you can certainly go back to these lectures repeatedly. The fact that the class is being video streamed is not a reason to absent yourself from this class. Now, we are all adults. I don't take attendance, whether it's four people or 400. Uh, I, I don't think that ought to be done, frankly, in colleges. I think this is something that one should leave behind in schools. you know. Um, but there is no substitu substitute for coming to class. Uh, because I can assure you, you're not going to fall asleep in my class. You may disagree with what I have to say on a great many occasions, but I think I articulate my positions clearly. Uh, and I think you ought to come to class because the manner in which a thought is expressed and the interaction makes a considerable difference. All right? um, these are things that one only learns with time, uh, but watching something on the TV screen and watching a lecture live are two very different things. Okay, so it's not the video streaming, I repeat, is not intended to be uh, a substitute for your absenting yourself from class. All right, now the requirements very simply are the following. Uh, you come to class, uh, class participation counts for 10%. And uh, what I mean by that very simply is that, you know, in many cases that will simply stay neutral. That there's some of you are going to be, who won't be saying a word in 10 weeks. There's some of you who might be a little more active. Um, we don't, this is an upper division class, there are no TAs, there are no discussion sections, there are two lectures, we meet Tuesday and Thursday, 11 to 12, 15, and uh, you can interrupt me. Feel free to interrupt me, and we can have a discussion in class, right? Uh, and for those of you who are active, and I know you're active, and you know, if your grade is a borderline between a B plus and an A minus, that's what that 10% will help you, it'll move you to an A minus. Uh, I'm almost ashamed, frankly, having to talk about grades because, again, that's something that, frankly, it, it's just one of those things that you have to do because we're living in a market economy. Everybody here is interested in a job. But learning has absolutely nothing to do with grades. Absolutely nothing. Zero. You know? But I know that all of you are interested. I mean, I've gone through college myself. I didn't, I didn't arrive here where I am without having gone to college and graduate school and earned a doctorate. So I've been in this. I've been at UCLA, by the way, for 23 plus years. So I've got quite a bit of experience teaching. Uh, and I know that, it, that all of you are interested in grades, but you learn better if you stop thinking about grades. That, that would be the simplest way to put it. All right? um, but, uh, but one has to be pragmatic about it. One has to have one's feet on the ground. And so that's what I'm letting you know, that that 10% will in most cases be neutral. That is, that you didn't really say much, you didn't really do much, but you came around, I saw you. So, you know, it, it just stays neutral. But if you, you know, uh, there are students, remarkably, again, the fact that I have to say it is just extraordinary. Uh, how do I know someone hasn't been coming to class? Because, you know, after the midterm is handed back to you in the seventh week, and I keep on announcing, please come collect your midterm, and some students, at the end of the class, there'll be three students who haven't picked up their midterm. And that's how I know that you're not coming to class. You know, right? I mean, it's extraordinary, really, but it happens. Every single class I've taught, lecture class, it's happened. All right? So that's 10%. Now, the formal requirements are there's a midterm. It's a take-home midterm. And you have about 40 to 43 hours, something like that. You get in on a Tuesday, uh, you know, sometime around 4 p.m. That's when I finish my seminar class. As I told you, I have a seminar, 1 to 3.50 today. And as soon as I get back to my office, I email the, the exam to you. And then you bring a printout of your answer okay, in class on Thursday. So you have, as I said, about 42, 43 hours. Take home exam means it's open book. You consult your notes. You consult your notes. You can go and listen to the, uh, the lectures. Uh, you know, if you don't want to see my face, just do the audio version. Uh, because it's available both in audio and video, right? So uh, that's, and, and there'll be, you know, I don't give ID questions. Uh, I don't give questions, I don't give you a world map and say identify, you know, the port of Madras. Again, that's high school geography, frankly. Uh, you're going to get essay questions, you'll get three essay questions, and you'll answer two out of those three essay questions. As simple as that. About two, two and a half, 
pages double spaced for each. So, you know, roughly five pages, roughly, in the vicinity. The final exam is again a take home, but you have one week to write it. You get it at the end of class, the last lecture, which will be Thursday of week 10, and you give it back on the following Thursday. You send it to me as an email attachment. The directions are given very clearly in the syllabus. You send it to me back as a single document, you know, as a Word document, not as a PDF, as a Word document. And again, the format is essay questions. Uh, generally, you will get six questions and you'll answer four. So you get some choice. You get some choice. Uh, and typically, the way I do it is that you know the six questions will be divided in three groups of two questions each. Group one, you get two questions, you have to answer both. Group two, you get two questions, you answer one out of two. Group three, you get two questions, you answer one out of two. So you answer four out of six. Uh, and the final exam encompasses the entire course. Entire course. Uh, I will be dropping hints, some subtle, some not so subtle, about what are important things. Because very often a student will come and say, well, how should I prepare? Well, as far as I know, there's only one way to prepare for an exam, which is you read the material and you listen to the lectures. There's nothing else to do. And of course, think and be imaginative. That's all. That's, there's nothing else to do. You, know? you don't have to go to Wikipedia. You don't have to go to some you know, obscure websites, which will tell you all kinds of garbage about you know, the history of British India. No, you don't have to do any of that. You just do the readings, come to the lectures, and you're prepared. As simple as that. Okay, and the midterm accounts for 40%, uh, and the final accounts for 50%. So that's 10, 40, and 50, that's, that's the 100% for the course, okay? Those are the requirements. Any questions, any doubts, as far as the requirements are concerned? Yes? The format of the final, is it going to be essays like the midterm? Essays. A absolutely. That's all. You just get essays. I might give you an essay question, you know. Um, well, at this point, it wouldn't make much sense, right? If I, but let's say, for example, what is Edward Said's theory of Orientalism? Mm -hmm. And how, why, how might it be useful in understanding the history of British India? Mm -hmm. That's an essay. And you write an essay. Two, two and a half pages, you know. Thank you, sir. Yeah. OK? All right. So uh, that's, that's essentially what the course requirements are. Now the readings. Virtually everything is online except for two books, which have been ordered for you. Has anyone gone to the bookstore yet? Are they there? They're there. All right. All right. So the books are there. There are two books. One of them is a novel by E.M. Forster called A Passage to India. Uh, we're going to discuss the novel at some length, not at great length, but we'll discuss it. There is also a film made of that novel, which I recommend. You're not required to watch it by, at all, but it's actually quite an enjoyable film. And it's made by one of these great directors of a certain kind, David Lean. You know, he used to make these massive sort of epic films, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, it's really worth watching. Uh, I don't know if they have it on Netflix, they probably do, but I'm sure you can find it somewhere or the other. So you'll, re you'll read that novel, that's towards the end of the class, and then there's a book by Shumit Sarkar, who's an Indian historian called Modern India. You won't be reading all of it, but you'll be reading good portions of it. Uh, but the bulk of the readings are online. And I have actually checked, and they're all there. They're all there. I, I, I checked every single link. Uh, you know, when the syllabus was put up about a month ago, uh, there may be one odd reading perhaps that's missing, but everything else is there. Uh, and I suggest, by the way, I mean, you know, you, you, you use your own discretion, your own judgment, but I suggest you just download all of them at one shot so you have them all, put them in a folder, and then you're done, you know, and then you can access the readings whenever you want to. All right. Uh, in India, these are habits that one acquires from India because you never know when the electricity is going to go out and the internet connection is going to go out. Uh, but you know, when you acquire habits, they're hard to shed. Uh, so, but it's useful. It's useful to to uh, to have the readings handy in, in a single fo folder. Okay. Uh, so, the, so I've taken care of the readings. I've told you about them. 
Uh, now let me tell you a little bit about the length of the readings. You know, when I first came to UCLA, that was, as I said, about 24 years ago, I had done my doctorate from the University of Chicago. And uh, I can tell you that classes I had there, 500 pages of reading a week for a course was standard. And the first thing I found when I came here was the evaluations, all the student evaluations. Oh, this guy's out to murder us. He thinks that this is the only class we're taking. Well, you know, if you're students, that's what you're supposed to be doing. You know, you're not supposed to be monkeying around with an iPhone for 10 hours a day and texting and this and that. Well, of course, but I know that's the nature of life, that people do all kinds of things. Uh, so what do you suppose I did? I eventually, over the years, I lowered the readings. You know, it went down to 450. I still got the same complaint, then down to 400, then a dramatic cut to 250. I still got the same complaint. Uh, and then down to 200, and that was still the overwhelming complaint. I mean, uh, if you want to take a course, you have to read, my friends. There's no other way. You know? I mean, this is not Trump TV. You know, you just Twitter, and that's it. Right? I mean, the people who read. And we have to learn how to read texts. We are losing that capacity in this age. I have children who are your age, so I know that. My, my daughter just started freshman college, you know? And you know, reading is like a novelty. You know, I mean, it's like something bizarre or as exotic for a lot of students today. Because this is, to such an overwhelming extent, a visual culture. A visual culture. But you have to read. And then there's reading and there's reading. There are things that the text says to you, and there are things that the text says to you which you cannot quite decipher unless you know how to read a text. There are strategies for reading a text. You know? And similarly, there are strategies for seeing a film. You know, I, I also work on mainstream Hindi cinema, and all my friends and my family members have written a book called Divar. Um, is there anyone here who was seen that film? Any? You remember the film? 1975, Amitabh Bachchan, right? You know, the superstar of Indian cinema. It's a mainstream commercial film. I wrote a whole book on this film, on this one single film. And all my family, friends, family members, and friends and acquaintances would marvel at the fact that when I used to watch Hindi films, as I still do, I'd actually watch them with a notepad in my hand, and they'd say, notepad? I mean, a Hindi film, what is there to analyze? It's, it's just like boy meets girl, girl meets boy, you run around a tree, you know, you sing some songs. What is there to analyze? That's very often the question I'd get, you know? No, no, actually, you know, these films are deeply structured in the mythic elements of Indian culture, just like the Western. I mean, if you, what is the most preeminently American genre? It's the Western, you know? And the plot's very simple. You know, a man comes in, rides a horse, into this town, there's only, you know, there's a barber shop, there are a few pubs or saloons, right? And a few gunslingers, and you say, well, that's it, there's nothing else. Yeah, but all the primordial elements of the American myth making are there. The nature culture divide, for example, the idea of the frontier, the idea of the rugged Yankee individual, etc., etc., etc. There's always a school barn there, you know? You, if you see a film like The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, you've never seen it, see it. Extraordinary American film. 1962, John Ford, right? Because you get the entire story, all the myth-making is present in that film. Now, that's how these Hindi films work, too. But, in other, but one, has, one has to understand how to read a film, all right? And one of the things we're going to be doing here only tangentially, because this is not a class in literary criticism or discourse analysis, right? where I could spend, let's say, three hours on 20 lines. Right? Right? Three hours on 20 lines and just parse them repeatedly in different ways. We could do that. But, but we're, we're, we're covering 300 years span of history. Right? But tangentially, in order to understand some arguments, we're going to do that as well. All right? 
So let me reiterate what I've already mentioned. The readings are all available online. You have access to them. There are two books that you have to buy. I've already spelled out the requirements. Now a word about technologies in the classroom. If you want to use a PC, some of you are, you're welcome to do so. But I'm going to request you, you know there's this temptation. There are students who do fact checking. So let's say I say something. I say the life expectancy in India you know, in 1850 was 20. Let me just throw out a random figure. And, you know, somebody might say, ah, oh, that's, that, that's impossible. You're thinking to yourself, let me quickly check. You know, because you've got internet connection. Then you do the fact checking. Again, you know, we're not running an election here. Okay? Please don't do things like that. All right? And then, and then immediately raise your hand. Professor, you know, I, I just checked that, but I don't really find any evidence for that. You know? Oh, it, it's, yeah. I mean, there have been a couple of occasions where someone did the fact checking and they say, yeah, well, you know, look, yeah, if, if you want to dispute something, dispute it, but you don't have to dispute the facts on the spot. Okay? I'm not suggesting to you that you shouldn't dispute what I say. If you feel inclined to dispute it, by all means do so. All right? I'm ready for that. <laughs> right? But. Do not abuse the technologies in the classroom. It's as simple as that. Use it for note taking and that's it. No use of iPhones except possibly if you read the syllabus. I haven't yet made a call on that because I really am going to do that for my next quarter class, which is a larger class on contemporary world history, uh, where I want to use poll everywhere uh, just to see how the technology really works. We might do that in this class, but I'm going to make a decision on that by Thursday. You know, and if we do, then, then obviously you can use your iPhone. You would have to use your iPhone or some gadget you know, for that. All right? But otherwise, uh, no technologies in the classroom except strictly, as I said, for, for note taking. All right? Now, let's turn to substantive matters. Okay? There's five or six big considerations that I want to put before you today. This course covers, as I said, a span of roughly 300, 350 years. The bulk of it is going to be, you know, 1750s down to 1947, about 200 years. The bulk of our time will be spent on that. Now, the history of British India has, is a well-established field. Uh, there have been uh, hundreds of scholars who have worked on it. And the scholarship has changed considerably over the course of the last three decades. When people used to, scholars used to work on this history, let's say in the 50s, 60s, very often it was from the standpoint of trying to understand the nature of British conquests in India. You know, how did the British acquire an empire in India? I mean, acquiring an empire in India is not quite like acquiring an empire in Samoa. I mean, India is a huge place, right? And initially, India was governed by a company, the East India Company. You know? Now, how did a bunch of people working for a company, how did they actually acquire control over such a large piece of territory? And you know the cliche, right, that India was a jewel in the crown, as they say. Because, of course, the British Empire extended well beyond India. The British had enormous possessions in Africa, right? And we know that places like Singapore, the Malay world, not Indonesia. Indonesia was under Dutch rule because, of course, if you look at 19th century Asia and Africa, it had been carved up. The European powers controlled virtually every place. Uh, there's an odd man out here and there, such as Ethiopia uh, in Africa, uh, although that's a very tricky one because it, it, Ethiopia was under Italian occupation for a very short period of time, and, and Thailand was not, was not under imperial rule, colonial rule. Uh, but if you look at Indonesia, Indonesia was under the Dutch, Vietnam, right, Indochina, as it used to be called, under the French, right? Uh, if you go to Africa, well, there's a Belgian Congo, uh, the French, Okay, uh, the British, even German Southwest Africa. Germany came into the game very late because you needed, reun you needed unification in Germany. Germany itself was not a unified country. By the time they got into this, the other European powers had virtually swallowed up the whole world. 
But of course, the Germans took whatever they could. It's not like they were saints, far from that, right? So what we're saying here is that, you know, there's this extraordinary anomaly that you've got a company ruling India. We're going to try to understand how that came about. But in the 50s and 60s, I would say through the 70s, the scholarship really focused on such things as the lives of the great generals. You know, the, the pro-councils of empire, as they were called, the governor general, the viceroy, you know, these senior British officials, you know, their lives, their biographies, you know, what they were doing, how did they rule. Then there was this element of military conquest, military expansion. And of course, there were some people who worked on the economic dimensions of colonialism. Around the 1980s, for a variety of reasons, that scholarship began to change. A lot more attention began to be paid to such things as, well, how did the common people fare under colonialism? What was, what was, you know, that if you're studying a nationalist movement, how does one usually study nationalist movements? One usually assumes that you take a nationalist organization. India had a very famous nationalist organization, which became the model for nationalist organizations in much of the world, in Africa. The organization I'm talking about is the Indian National Congress. Indian National Congress. And for those of you who remember Nelson Mandela, right, who passed away just a few years ago, so Mandela used to be the head of the ANC, African National Congress. The ANC was itself originally modeled after the Indian National Congress. And there were a number of such similar similar organizations in the rest of Africa. So nationalism, that of course that was a major preoccupation on the Indian side especially, right? Because when you do history of British India, there's the British side of things, as it were, and then there's the Indian side of things. And the preoccupation of many of the Indian historians certainly was with something called nationalism. You know, how did Indians resist colonial rule? And what did they do? They basically studied such things as the Congress, the role of the Congress, so forth and so on, institutional structures. But then in the 1980s, that scholarship began to change because there was this consideration, well, how do we actually understand the nature of revolt and resistance from the ground up, right? What were the ways in which the British actually exercised hegemony, right? And we'll, we'll look at that word later on, right? try to understand how hegemony differs from domination. How did they actually exercise hegemony? What were the ways in which they were able to insinuate themselves into the country? Right? How did they gain the collaboration, if you want to call it that, of natives? Because is it possible to have any kind of structure of oppression unless some people on the other side, that is those who are being colonized, in fact, in some fashion or the other, collaborate or become complicit right? with the structures of colonial rule? And then, of course, there were considerations such as you can imagine, for example, feminism. How would you look at feminist critiques of British, the British agenda in India? What were the particular ways in which women were impacted? Right? And, you know, you shouldn't think, by the way, that, oh, all of this was some kind of surrender to political correctness. No, the scholarship changed for good reasons. It changed because we became sensitive to many of these considerations that many nationalists, for example, were entirely insensitive to problems that afflicted women in particular, right? And this is what obviously gender studies and feminism alerted many scholars to, that we would have to be sensitive to the particular ways in which colonialism not simply impacted women in India, but what are the ways in which discourses themselves are gendered? We're going to see that, right? Why is it that the British were so concerned about improving the lives of women in India? It's not, it's not as if they didn't have enough work to do back in Britain itself, they did. I mean, if you look at the early 19th century, no one can argue that the lives of British women were easy. In fact, women in, in England had no access to education in the early part of the 19th century. And yet the British are saying, ah, we're going to save brown women from brown men, right? right? Which, by the way, is an argument that still is current today because the whole in invasion of Afghanistan 
by the U.S. was predicated on a number of assumptions. One big assumption was, you know, Afghan women, they're just mutilated by their own men. We need to save these women from their own men. And we need white men to do it. You know, they're going to come on their horses, you know, and be the great knights. Right? That was, in fact, if you look very carefully at American discourse, you can see that. Right? And th to say this, by the way, is not to say that the condition of Afghan women was not bad. It is bad. Right? But we're, we're, we're trying to understand what is the nature of a discourse. How is a discourse gendered in particular ways? And I'm suggesting to you simply that when we look at the history of British India, we find that the nature of scholarship really changed beginning in the 80s for a variety of reasons. Right? And so what you're going to be reading here is uh, something that emerges from much more recent scholarship on the history of the British in India. Right? We're not really looking at texts that were written in the 50s and 60s. We're looking at much of the scholarship that emerged in recent years. And we're also going to be looking at primary documents. Primary documents. You know, so the British pass a law abolishing such and such atrocity in India. Well, what's the nature of that law? Right? So we look at, and again, we're not going to do that, you know, with each and every law, obviously not. But we'll just look at one or two illustrations of that to see what the nature of a primary text is and how does one analyze a primary text, okay? Now, let's move from there to a broader set of considerations. And that broader set of considerations is, what does it mean to do history, right? And so let me engage you in a kind of a Socratic exercise. You know the Socratic method. You know, I ask a question, you answer it, I keep on asking you until I get the answer I want, as it were. Okay? So here's a question for you, very simply. Right? What does history have to do with? What does history deal with? Don't be shy, jump into it, because something must be on your fingertips right away. What does it deal with? Well, history is a modern interpretation of what the past was and what it represents and sort of our understanding of it. Our, I guess it's our understanding of the past. Okay. So would you permit me to simplify this and say history deals with the past? Sure. That's what you just said, right? Okay. So if I'm teaching a class, yes? I think it helps us to understand our society and world today. All right. Okay. Any other speculations? Yes. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, I like what you have said for one reason. My wording would be different. I'll tell you why. I like what you have said because this is what we want to be doing in this class. We want to be thinking politically. You have given a political answer, right? You, you've, you've straight away jumped to the argument that history is a narrative of the past and more often than not it is a narrative furnished by those who were quote the winners you know i don't like winners and losers that's again the language of someone we know right that i've been mentioning that's the only language he knows oh loser loser you know right <laughs> uh, i don't like winners and losers because actually uh, i'm going to suggest to you towards the end of the class and i'm going to suggest occasionally that victory is very traumatic for the victors too. They don't know it, all right? It's very traumatic, not just for the losers, but for the victors too. So, but I want to look at all the answers here because I'm not, uh, this is not what I was looking around for. I expected it, but this is what it means. So, you said the past. Now, for example, I'm gonna be teaching a class next quarter, I mentioned that in passing, called Contemporary World History, right? So contemporary is not the past, would you agree, right? But, but it's a history class, right? So we don't want to say that history deals only with the past. It, you could be doing contemporary history, 
I'm a historian. I could be looking at the American elections right now. And I could be looking at it from the point of view of a historian. Because then we might say, it doesn't have to do with the past necessarily. It may have to do with the past. Very often, it has to do with the past. But history may be also a mode of inquiry, a certain mode of inquiry, right? As opposed to another mode of inquiry, right? Another mode of inquiry. So let me put it to you this way. Let's take four social science disciplines which are related and which yet are actually quite different. All right, history, geography, anthropology, right? These are all, by the way, uh, in the social sciences. They're all in the social sciences, right? And sociology. Now, here's a question for you. If you had to describe each discipline with one word, I'm going to suggest to you that each of these deals eminently with something that is different. There may be a crossover. I'm willing to grant that. I'm not saying that these are completely discrete, walled off disciplines. All right? But after all, we do have them as different disciplines. Why? The reason we have them is because. The practitioners of each of these disciplines understands that each discipline is discrete. It deals with some realm that marks it off from the other disciplines. If you had to use one word, maximum two, but you can do it with one word, what does each of these disciplines deal with? Anyone? Yes? I thought of two words, but uh, origins and relationship. Which which of these disciplines? Sorry. Re well, relation, relationship. Relationships, but they all deal with relationships. Yeah. What is discrete? What is distinct? What is distinct about? If you said, okay, so you said origins. Which of these deals with origins? History or anthropology? Yeah, both. Both. But what is so? You see, that's what you see. The question, right? The question is. Imagine, we, we don't have to imagine, we know that the, there are different departments at UCLA. There's a department of history, a department of geography, anthropology, sociology. I could add, by the way, another one if you want, okay, psychology, right? And I'm going to suggest to you each of these deals with something that is quite distinct. In one word, tell me what each of these disciplines deals with. That makes it distinct. Geography would be landscape. Landscape, yes, but, but give me the, the shorter analytical word for it. Land. No, it doesn't deal only with land. Yeah. You, you could be doing physical anthropology as opposed to cultural anthropology. You know what physical anthropology is? You know, you measure the distance from here to here, and you think you know something about the world. I, I know it sounds absurd, but that's exactly what they did. You know, measure the size of the skull, Territory. craniometry. Territory. What's the analytical? Category. Resources? Huh? Resource? No, because again, think of it this way. Resource economics deals with resources too, right? There's something that is distinct, analytically, very simple. Location. Sorry? Location. Location. That's a little bit like landscape. You're in the, moving in the right direction, but what are the coordinates for anything in the human universe? Place. Place. No. Place. Okay. And what's the analog to that? Place is local. When it's not local, what do we call it? You're, you're almost there. Place is local. Okay. So what place are you going to? Right? Local. Right? What's the generic abstract category? You're almost there. Space. Space. Geography deals with space. That is its distinctiveness. That's its distinctiveness. Every social science discourse is, and I'm going to show you very simply with an illustration later on, how we can cut temporal categories into spatial categories. I've given the game away. What does history deal with? Time. Time. It deals with time. Past is 
a subset of time because it also deals with the present and the future. The reason we study history, presumably, among other reasons, is because we want to get a better understanding of who we are and have a better future, right? Future, present, past, these are orders of temporality. And so what does history deal with? It deals with time. Of course, we're going to complicate it. Now, anthropology. What does anthropology deal with? One word. Sorry? Sorry? Humanity. Humanity. Doesn't history deal with humanity? It does. It does, it does right? It does. Right? Think of it this way. That all the social sciences deal with the human. And the humanities deal with the human. There is something called the post-human. Now we won't get into that for the <laughs> moment. Okay? But I'm saying, okay, when... Is there an anthropology student here? No. All right. Does anybody have any idea what the origins of anthropology are? Huh? Evolution. Evolution. Yeah, I don't know. But you see, when I say, okay, when did it begin as a discipline? Let me, re let me rephrase the question. Oh. When did it begin as a discipline? 20th century. Oh, no, the end of the 19th century. So. What century? 17th. Why 17th? Any? Okay. All right. Let me let me let me uh, uh, push this a bit further. The French, the British, right? Two of the major imperial powers, right? So, I'm giving you a hint: imperial powers. Was there anthropology before colonialism, as a discipline? As a discipline, right? No. As is, huh? No. no. Okay. Exactly. So, so, who are these people that, when you study anthropology, who do you study? Let's say you were an American anthropologist. What would you do? Just make a make an educated guess. Do you do you who? Huh? Anyone? Who who would you study? Native Americans. American anthropology started with the study of Native Americans. So who are the Native Americans? One word. Can you think of it? The other. What, by, what, huh? The other. The other. Yeah. That's it. The other. An anthropologist studies the other. You do not study yourself. Now, of course, that's changing. I'm, I grant you that. I mean, all right? You do not study yourself. You study the other. And usually, it's a inferior other. I don't mean that they are actually inferior. You have imputed that quality to them. American anthropologists, when, where would they go? They would go to places like, other than going to the reservations in the US, they go to Papua New Guinea. Right? Papua New Guinea, India. American anthropologists did not go and study the child rearing habits of the English. Or whether they ate with a fork and knife. No. They would study the child-rearing habits of the Papuan, Papuans, people from Melanesia, from Polynesia, some villagers in India, etc., etc. You study the other, the other. That is what anthropology is about. Okay. Now, what about sociology? What would be the, what, if you're not studying the other, what are you studying? The self. the self. When you are a sociologist in the United States and you study the working class culture of white people in the U.S., you're a sociologist. Typically. Now, again, I, 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 I want to emphasize that I'm very well aware of what's happening in these fields. So I know that... They're obviously the fields have undergone changes and anthropologists today don't always go to India or Papua New Guinea or Samoa or the Congo or wherever. Okay? The vast bulk of them still do, by the way. They, they may actually be going and studying white poor culture in the Appalachian 
region. Or they may be studying, you know, uh, the remnants of certain com black communities in Mississippi. But typically, that would be done by sociologists. You study the self. Self. And w what about psychology? Okay? The psychic self. The psychic self. Right? That's where the word psychology, right? You study the so psychology has an element of interiority. Sociology doesn't have that in the same way. And anthropology is the external other. If I may put it this way, anthropology is the external other. Sociology is the internal other. And the psychology is the other within yourself. Right? That's how these disciplines are demarcated. Now, I also want to emphasize at this juncture that there are ways in which we can convert these categories. I'm going to give you an illustration. You don't have to accept the illustration because it's an argument that is in some ways very bold and if you understand the implications of it. All right. You have all heard the word. And you know, you're of a generation where the word is used less now than it used to be when I was growing up. OK. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about most of the people in this room. There's some, not, not everyone, right? Uh, there are certain words that have lost their resonance. They're still used, but not used as often. So that part of the world which is in Africa, you know what the American administrations like to call failed states. You've heard the phrase, right? Uh, again, a very deplorable phrase, which has a very complicated politics, you know, uh, but we won't get into that at the moment. So, you know, they, they, these places, they, re they refer to uh, Libya, Somalia, Somalia they're referred to as failed states. But the language that used to be used and is still used to a slightly lesser degree, though, than, as I said, let's say 15 years ago, what would you, what would you call this part of the world uh, generically? without referring to a particular state, places in Asia and Africa and so forth and so on? Third world. Third world. Okay, that's one. What's, what would be another phrase? Developing. Developing. Developing word. Okay? It used to be also called, by the way, before developing, it used to be called underdeveloped. But, you know, that's like, you can't use that now. It's politically completely incorrect. You know, you have to say that, yeah, let's invest some hope and then they're moving somewhere. They're developing. <laughs> You know, right? You, you can't call them, you know, underdeveloped anymore. But, you know, when I was growing up and when I was reading this literature, you encountered the phrase all the time. This was the underdeveloped world. And so, by the way, first world, second world, third world, you know, most people don't know the genealogies of these terms, you know. When did they come about? You know, okay? Cold War, right? And then, you know, so what's the second world, right? Yeah. So, for example, Eastern Europe. All right. Okay. Behind the Iron Curtain. Right. To use Winston Churchill's phrase. So now, however, this is what I want to point out to you. Let's go with developing world. So this is when we say developing world, we're referring to these parts of the world, right, where the economies are in you know, shambles or relative shambles, there's high levels of poverty, uh, literacy levels are low, maternal mortality rates are high, infant mortality rates are high, etc., etc. Right? So when we say developing world, are we referring to a geographical entity? Right? Because we say, hey, India is part of the developing world. Sudan is part of the developing world. Somalia, right? Most people assume it's a geographical concept, right? In other words, if I, if I had a world map here and I said, identify the countries that are part of the developing world, you'd straight away go to some places in Africa and say, yeah, this is, and Asia, and, correct? Geographical concept. However, and this is what I mean, you can, you can translate spatial categories into temporal categories and vice versa. It is actually more so than a geographical concept. It is a temporal concept. 
Why? Why? And what do we mean when we say it's a temporal concept? Right? What we mean is really the following. That you are here. This is Somalia, Sudan, and India. India doesn't like to be lumped with Somalia and Sudan. No country, no, nobody wants to be lumped with Somalia and Sudan. But I'll just do it. Okay? Because I can tell you, I'm an Indian, and it's not something that I feel proud of, but fact of the matter is that, of course, in India, and in India is far ahead of Somalia and Sudan in many other domains, but when you look at malnutrition rates, India is worse off. Worse? Worse off than Somalia and Sudan. When you look at maternal mortality rates, okay, you just check the indices. Look up a book by Amartya Sen. All right? Uh, published very recently, and it gives you the data. It simply cannot be contested. It's just overwhelming, the evidence. Yeah, India might be a nuclear power, and it may have a 5,000-year-old history and a glorious civilization, etc., etc., you know. But the fact of the matter is that on many of these indices, it's doing very, very badly, as badly as sub-Saharan Africa. That's, so that's why I'm lumping it there for the moment, for the sake of argument. Now, so this is the developing world, okay? What is, what, what is the objective, what has been set out as the goal for these people? To become part of the developed world. Yeah, uh, that's right. So you see, they should be climbing upward. That's the incline of history. However, here's the problem. You, you want to catch up here because this is where the developed world is. What's the problem? By the time they catch up, what's going to happen? We're not there anymore. Yeah, you're not there anymore. You have moved somewhere else. So you know what our history is? What my history as an Indian is? And what the history of a Somalian and a person from Sudan is? My history is, I, all I need to do is really, I just need to spend the rest of my life and my children need to spend the rest of their lives trying to catch up. In other words, I'm not going to live out my history, I'm going to live out your history. Because your conception of what is the good life is what I should be aiming at. That's called colonization. Now, all of those of you who are in development studies, if there are any, you should be thinking about what actually is going on in something called development studies. Okay? And of course, I know there are people in development studies who are sensitive to the critiques and so forth and so on, but the word development itself is a word that cannot be rescued, frankly. Are you not implying, I mean, that so the, impl the implication there of what you said, in my yeah. opinion, is that um, the word developing and the characteristics that define developing yes. are things that can be contested. So you're sa as in, you're saying they're not absolute. Yes. But I would say that, you know, life expectancy yeah. and uh, you know maternal maternity yeah. those are pretty absolute categories so it's not that you're trying to reach a the developed world it's yeah. you're trying to improve the life of your people absolutely yeah yeah sure that. sure no no i understand you right you no no you what your argument is an argument that one would expect to encounter here because it's a very reasonable argument Okay, and the reasonable are, it's reasonable because you're saying that, well, isn't it the case that the ambition of those people who have come up with the idea of development is that those who are lagging behind should share in the idea of the good life. You didn't use that phrase, but I'm going to use that. The good life would be such things that, that yeah, people should have access to clean hospitals, clean water, electricity, Education. literacy, so forth and so on. I mean, after all, who could be opposed to that? Okay. So your argument is a reasonable one. However, we have to understand how ideas become ideologies. Let's look at it this way, very simply, nationalism. I mean, if you are living in India, and we are going to be studying nationalism, because when we do the history of British India, we're going to be looking at nationalist movements, right? And there's no question that nationalism was desirable, it was needed. However, we also know that nationalism, when it becomes an ideology, can become fatal. Because in the name of nationalism, a nation state can do anything to its people. Anything. 
And the U.S. is not exempt from that, by the way. Don't, don't think that this is only a problem for people living in Bosnia or India or Iraq or Libya. No. Right? This, this is a fundamental problem. The, the ideology of the nation state, the whole idea of the national security state. The U.S. is the largest national security state by a measure of 10 to 1. In comparison with any other country in the world, I mean, the kind of regimes of surveillance and governance you have in this country are astronomical. You just look at the budgets and the number of organizations involved in this country in preserving national security. That's nationalism, right? So you see the problem that it's not simply that because I know what the rejoinder will be. We, we can anticipate that. You'll say, ah, but they're good nationalisms and they're bad nationalisms. No. There's good development and there's bad development. There's development with a human face. You know, they've come up with all kinds of alternative development, development with a human face, humane development, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we'd have to understand, I'm not going to be able to argue that through right now because that's something you'll hear throughout the course and you'll see where the argument's coming from. But here I was simply trying to explain to you that what appears to be a geographic concept, that is the developing world, is in fact a temporal concept. It's a temporal concept because it says that some countries are at this stage, they have to move along the incline of history, okay? They have to move, all right? In order to be, and what I'm saying is that actually, what are the implications of that? The implications are the people down here, they're not actually living out their history. They're living out someone else's history. Their future is already Europe's present. Look at, look at that, think of it. Their future is in fact Europe's present, okay? And when I say Europe, I mean the West, including the United States, you know, the Anglo world, Canada, etc., etc. All right. So in this class, we are not interested only in history of British India. That is the subject of the class. And you'll certainly be getting a lot of that. But my intent here is to help you think through analytically about the world and the categories that we work with. The history of British India will provide the illustrations for the larger kind of arguments that I'm interested in. Right? And I hope it will help you interrogate your present and your location in the United States. Because after all, we are studying colonialism. That's what it is. We're studying colonialism is not something which is an abstraction that refers to something that happened a while ago. I mean, colonialism, we're in the midst of it all the time. There are various ways in which one gets colonized. Nations get colonized, people get colonized. Individuals get colonized by various forms of terror. The word colonialism and the verb colonize have all kinds of implications, you know? I mean, a man who's... Uh, abusive all the time towards his spouse, his wife or his sister or whoever, in some ways he's colonizing her as well. He's imposing certain structures upon that person, you know. Okay? So we're interested in a wider set of considerations because I want you to sort of think analytically about the categories that you deploy to make sense of the world. Because whatever we study, we do it from the point of view of trying to make sense of the world. All right? And so this course is not only, therefore, about history of British India. It is predominantly about that, and you'll see that there's going to be actually a lot of that, you know, including some detail which may not be necessary, right? But Bear in mind the larger sets of considerations that I'm really raising. Now, one final broader set of considerations, uh, and I'm going to devote my next lecture to that, uh, but I just want to immediately start you off thinking about it, and that is that we are concerned with the problems of interpretation. 
whatever we study, there is the question of interpretation. How do we interpret certain phenomena? All interpretations are not equal. I am by no means suggesting, I don't believe in it for a moment, if someone said, well, it's my opinion, and she said, that's my opinion, and she said, that's my opinion, well, that doesn't mean that all opinions are equal. Some opinions are more substantive than others. And, of course, I will be putting forward opinion, interpretations that I find more compelling. That doesn't mean that you are obligated to find them compelling. Not at all. You might say that, well, you, you know, I mean, you know, there are a lot of historians of, of uh, uh, imperialism down to the present day. And then they go on to occupy positions at places like Harvard. Niall Ferguson is, a, uh, is one of my favorite examples. You know, a Harvard Don, as they say, you know, used to be an Oxford Don, and now he's a Harvard Don, as it were. I, 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 these people have spent their whole life sort of saying, oh, these are the pros and cons of imperialism. Uh, you know, okay, here's the pro. British brought railways to India, British brought English, and thus Vinilal here is speaking in English now. Isn't that great? Right? And then what are the, what are the, the cons side? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, India had quite a lot of famines. Maybe British policy contributed to them in some ways. Grudgingly, they might, ex right? This is a game they're playing, pros and cons. I'm not interested in playing that game even remotely. I think that colonialism, if at the end of the day, you know, 10 of you walked out uh, at the end of the class, uh, week 10, and said, well, we think actually the British did a jolly good thing in India. Well, uh, uh, that's your prerogative if you want to think that way. But I don't think that forms of colonization can be really defended in any sense of the term. Right? We don't always want to be measuring phenomena by the results either. Right? Nor am I saying, by the way, that we measure them by intentions. I don't know what the intentions were all the time. There is no way for me to know. Yes, I can make some inferences from some texts. Uh, and I'm not saying, by the way, again, I'm not interested at all in the argument that the British were some diabolical evil geniuses or whatever. No. I'm just saying that when we study colonialism, you know, you know, we have to understand what are the ways in which colonial rule over a long period of time severely impacted a country such as India. And I do think that to some extent, unquestionably, the present condition of India has something to do with the fact that it was colonized over a period of 200 years. Now, I will tell you that the last census that was conducted in India before the British left India or quit India, 1947 is when independence arrived, and the British started doing a census beginning in 1871. They did it every 10 years. So the last census would have been 1941. You know what the life expectancy in India was in 1941 according to the census? These are not figures that some Indian has come up with. The life expectancy in India in 1941, that's not so far back in history, we're not talking about the Stone Age, was 29. 29 was the life expectancy in India in 1941. And I cannot tell you how many people died as a consequence of famines from 1880 to 1943, the last big famine shortly before independence, the Bengal famine in 1943. I'm talking about tens of millions. And do not for a moment think that famines are natural phenomena. They are not. They are not. The, there is a huge body of work which has gone to prove. Again, Amartya Sen, whose name I would mentioned before, you know, among many other scholars, but the first one who really made this argument and sustained it through a whole series of works, democracies do not have famines. They do not. One of the reasons they don't is because there is a system of accountability. In China, when you had a famine 1958 to 62, 40 million people died, 4-0. Okay, and, and Chinese Communist Party members, senior officials knew what was happening in the districts and they said, let them die. 
let them die. You know? Why? Because if a country has to develop, some people have to pay a price. And those some people usually happen to be people who are poor, peasants, women, minorities. Those are the ones who always pay the price. You know? So the, the, what is the point of the argument? You know, the, the point of the argument is that we are not interested in here in kind of evaluating, you know, the goods and the bad as such. We'll look at the implications. But I, but I think my position is very clear that, that colonialism is something that, frankly, is indefensible. All right? So when we say, just one moment, let me just finish my strand. So the problems of interpretation, however, extend well beyond this. They extend beyond this. Because there, the problems of interpretation have to do with what are the various ways in which the British shaped a certain understanding of India. The British come to India. They always, they have certain conceptions, right, of what a society is like, what a society ought to be like. They have certain notions of what they consider to be political institutions. So how do we deal with the other? How did they engage with this other? They created a discursive framework. A discursive framework means that colonialism is not simply a matter of understanding Oh, which general, British general, aided by, you know, a thousand soldiers, went and conquered which particular portion of India? The discursive framework means we have to understand what were the theories of imperialism? How did they put into place a whole set of institutions with what assumptions? What were their assumptions? What did, what did they know about India? What did they think about Indians? What did they understand by Indian religions? Right? I mean, you know, look at the English. I mean, in some ways, extremely provincial. I mean, English food was the worst food in the world and still is. Thankfully, now you can, there are 15,000 Indian restaurants in London alone. So you can, and in fact, I very often argue one reason why the British colonized India was they just wanted good food. You know, I mean, thank goodness, if you've been to Britain, you would know you can get good Indian food. I mean, otherwise, their idea of food was boiled carrots and peas and something called a steak and kidney pie. I mean, most atrocious food in the world, you know? Right? I mean, this is a, a extraordinarily provincial people going to a country with extraordinary linguistic diversity. You know? I mean, even today, if you look at a banknote, Right? Well, there's a whole demonetization thing, which I, so maybe I shouldn't be talking about banknotes. Some of you know what I mean. You know, India just banned 500 and 1,000 rupee notes and th about, about six weeks ago, and therefore 86% of the currency in circulation disappeared, right? Became illegal. All right, now, but if you look at a banknote, so when you look at the denomination, a 2,000 rupees note now, how many languages does it say that in? 15, 1, 5. But, but according to the census of India, there are a thousand Indian languages. And you need a banknote that big if you're going to list, right? These are, these are constitutional languages, each of which has tens of millions of speakers. I hear you going, going from England, right? Where, the pre, where predominantly the people are Protestant, Anglican, Right? Yeah, there were some Catholics, of course, still are, but predominantly Protestant country after the Reformation. Right? Yeah, and of course, a small Jewish population. You're going to a country where you're encountering Hinduism with its proverbial 330 million gods and goddesses. Not that anyone's ever done a census of them, you know. <laughs> right? So, and then Islam and Jewish communities and Christian communities in India, which date back to 70 AD, right? You know, I mean, religious diversity, linguistic diversity, they're far more complex than anything the English could have ever imagined. And yet they conquer 
these people. Right? So what is the theory of imperialism? What is the framework? What is the language they used? Right? So when they talk about a phrase called the lazy native, you know this phrase, you're going to encounter it. That very often the British officials would say, ah, oh, you know, the na la natives are lazy. I don't know what that means, really. I mean, I know what it means at one level. And I don't want to simply say, oh, it's offensive. Of course it's offensive. You know, that goes without saying. Right? But the idea that Indian peasants who, who are toiling in the sun for 10 hours a day are somehow lazy, right? I just something that you have to think about but you'll encounter it all the time you know the f uh, another favorite british trope as i call them right another favorite one the fanatic muslim you thought that this go goes back to 2001 read these texts you know the muslim is always fanatic by definition right by definition I mean, what you're seeing today has a history. And you'll see that in this whole discursive framework. Okay, So we are going to be looking at those things as well. We're not only going to be looking at such things as the military conquest of India. Obviously, to some extent, we have to understand how did British rule expand in India, because they didn't get all of India in one shot, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right? What were the natures of economic domination? You know, did India bleed under colonial rule or not? And mind you, by the way, this is not a ad very advanced course. So you know, there might be arguments, and you might say, "Well, not completely convinced," but that's fine because I don't have the the luxury of making a very advanced case for every argument. Right? So we can only spend, let's say, a lecture or two on the economic aspects. However, in the remaining five minutes, I, I use up my entire time. So uh, in the remaining five minutes, let me just very quickly tell you the nature of the syllabus. All right. So we've already started off. And in the following lecture, you've got two readings. The readings, by the way, are going to work out to about 150, 170 pages a week. Uh, which from my point of view is very, very reasonable. I've already spoken about this issue. All right? it, it can't really go down any further than that. Uh, the, the, the Edward says Orientalism, you're only reading 28 pages. Read it very carefully. Do not worry if you do not understand the Indian article. I'm not sure I understand all of it. He was one of my teachers, by the way. Uh, I read this in draft uh, before uh, it was published. Uh, but uh, it's a very important article. A, it, it's related to a big book he wrote, but you're not reading the book, Imagining India, for which you need several weeks. Um, don't worry, but you, you have to make an attempt, please. So when I say don't worry about it, it doesn't mean that you're absolved from reading it. You have to make an attempt. You know? We shouldn't always read things that are easy and that satisfy us. You know, we have to make an attempt. All right? Week two, the backdrop. The Mughals, before the British came, it's not like India was a vacuum, right? So what, was the, what were the political structures of governance in India in, before the British came? The coming of the Europeans, I say Europeans, not just the British, because there was a French presence, there was a Dutch presence, there was an English presence, Portuguese, right? right? And emergence of the East India Company. Again, you know, not a, not a complete narrative, but or a systematic narrative, but enough for that you should know what's really happening. Week three, company rule, um, when the East India Company finally acquires responsibility for certain portions of India. What was the nature of social life in early British India? What did the Englishmen do? They were mainly Englishmen at that point. There were not that many English women. We'll consider that as well, the implications of that. What did they do in India? You know, when they were not governing, when they were not disciplining the native, the unruly native, what were they doing, you know? Smoking the hookah, watching the dance, Indian women dance, for example, the notch dance as it was called, right? What was the nature of social life? And what was the nature of the conquest of India? And what were the administrative systems they put into place to govern India, 
Right? What kind of regulations were passed? What was the relationship between the company and the British Parliament? Right? <clears throat> so that's week three. Week four, text of governorship, theory and practice of governance. Here we actually look at what does governance really mean? How did they actually govern India? What were their theories? Were they afraid that if they said certain things that might offend Indians? Right? So we look at primary text here. Week five, that's sort of the meat of the course is weeks four and five in a way because this is where we look at the idea of the discursive framework, right? What, what, were, the, what were the frameworks of knowledge that the British used in India? And then week six, what was the nature of the relationship between Indians and the British in the 19th century, right? When British rule is now established, you know? What was the nature of relationships between Indian women and British men? You know the gin and, gin and tonic? A favorite drink, where was it invented? The club in India. In India. And here you've got these Englishmen sweltering in the heat. Oh, it'd be nice to have a gin and tonic with ice. Where did the ice come from? You, you think these are trivial questions? You wait in here. What happens? Okay? Yeah? So that's what I'm talking about the club, the hill station, the school, British institutions. Uh, you get the midterm, and then the second half, week seven, we start moving into nationalism, the Indian response, okay, beginning with the 1858 revolt. Then we look at social reform movements. How were women impacted? What did the bridge try to do to attempt to alleviate the distress of Indian women, right? Why were they so interested in these questions, you know? Did they have some special spot, weak spot for women? Or did they have a theory about how one evaluates a civilization and what is the role of women in that, right? And then week nine, full-fledged nationalism, the emergence of Mohandas Gandhi, otherwise known as Mahatma Gandhi, right? All of you should at least have some familiarity with him. Uh, and week 10, we continue with Gandhi and the achievement of Indian independence, the role of the Congress, and finally, as I said, leading to the partition. So that's going to be pretty much what we're going to be doing. All right? Okay, look forward to seeing you on Thursday.